Grasshopper here. Welcome back to Axis and Allies Gaming Academy. And this is Advanced Training, Part 5 in this episode. We're going to talk all about political situations. It's a difficult subject for many. It takes a lot of clarification. We're going to discuss declarations of war. We're going to get further into these neutral territories when playing Axis and Allies 1940 Global 2nd Edition. It's an epic World War II strategy board game. Before I continue, I want to just say that in my last video, I made a couple of very minor mistakes. Um, for example, I said that it was episode 3 and not episode 4. Things like that. But it's been out for a while. There's a few hundred views and uh, nobody has uh, commented and said that I made any mistakes. So that's good. However, that's not going to be the case throughout the whole series. I will make mistakes. Now, before I upload these I'm going to review my own videos. If I see that I made a mistake, I'm going to do what I'm going to call a final clip. So many of the corrections that I want to make within the same video will be at the end of the video in a final clip, just making clarifications or corrections. So I implore you to just watch the whole video, watch the end clip, and if I still got something wrong, please, please make a comment. All right, let's get started, shall we? So in my last video, everyone, I spoke about neutral territories, but I also mentioned neutral nations. What is a neutral nation? Well, it's a playable power, playable meaning that it has a turn sequence, its own income, and a role in this game. Therefore, a neutral territory cannot be a playable power. But a neutral nation that is a playable power, like the United States, for example, to begin the game, they are not at war essentially with any of the other playable powers. They're not allies either with any of the other playable powers. Now the United States as a neutral nation will have restrictions while they're not at war and they also have a timeline that lets them know when they can declare war if not already brought into the war by a potential enemy. So before we get into that we need to understand game rounds. Take a look. I have a dice here that indicates to the table that we are in game round number one. Now remember in the past I spoke to you in a previous video about predetermined order of play. So Germany is going to begin the game and they're also going to be beginning each game round because they are always first to go. Now France is always last to go. So a game round consists of every playable power having a turn and then when it goes to the top back to Germany we are going to go into the next game round and we're going to indicate that we are indeed in now in game round number two. This is important to learn and to know when it comes to declaring war. So I've created a display here using all the roundels of each playable power on the Europe side of the map. We'll get into the Pacific side here in a moment, but this is going to help me better explain which nations begin the game at war and which nations begin the game neutral. So take a look here. We've got a graphic on my map. It's a ghost box and I've placed inside there the roundels of each nation that begins the game at war. We have Germany and Italy. They represent the European Axis powers and they begin the game at war with Anzac, France, UK Europe and UK Pacific. Now we'll get into the UK Pacific and UK Europe split economy in a separate video. But for now we're going to show that the Union Jack represents the UK Pacific. Outside of this box we have the Soviet Union and the United States. They are nations that are not at war to begin the game. They are neutral nations. Let's go over to the Pacific. So we see over here on the Pacific side a different story inside the graphic box here uh, containing roundels of playable powers that are at war. We only have Japan and China in here that begin the game at war with one another and outside the box are the neutral nations here on the Pacific side. It might seem strange to you to see Anzac and UK Pacific neutral over here considering that Japan is an Axis power and on the side of Germany and Italy, which Anzac and UK Pacific are at war with on the Europe side of the map. 
Over here on the Pacific, a different political situation indeed. What we have is Anzac, United States, and UK Pacific. They are recognized as the Pacific Allies, just like Germany and Italy are recognized as the European Axis. We have the Pacific Allies. Now, there is going to be a declaration of war required in order to fight Japan here. Right now, Japan only has one enemy, and that is China. Now, of course, we have the United States and the Soviet Union, also neutral nations, over here on the Pacific side. So therefore, United States and Soviet Union are the only true neutral nations in regards to not having any playable power enemies and not having any playable power allies. So let's take a good look at the map now. Let's study these relationships between the nations and we'll begin with Germany. Why not? They go first. So we just found out that Germany begins the game at war with the UK, these tan pieces. They begin the game at war with these blue pieces, which are represented by France. And even Anzac, which has a couple of infantry here in Cairo. So it's quite possible that Germany and Anzac clash. Now, the only thing that you need to understand right now about UK Europe and UK Pacific is that they all have tan pieces. Therefore, Germany is at war with all tan pieces on the board. They have quite a few here to deal with right in front of them. Now, we learned that the Soviet Union is not at war. They're a neutral nation. Therefore, Germany is not an enemy of Russia, nor is it an ally. Now, we know our history books. We know that eventually Russia will come into the war, into this game, on the side of the allies, the same as America will come into the war eventually on the side of the allies. But for now, the Germans have a window of opportunity to deal with just the pieces, units, and sculpts on the board that they must deal with. And it's up to them when they want to conflict with Russia and America. Now, here Italy, we learned, is a ally of Germany. They represent the European Axis powers. And, of course, Germany will help and support Italy. And Italy will help and support Germany. Italy is also at war with France and UK and Anzac there as well. So now when we say European Axis powers, we do mean Italy and Germany. So if Italy or Germany attack um, Russia, then that is what we call a provoked attack and therefore Russia may declare war. However, if they are not attacked, they must stay out of the war until a timeline of round four. Let's take a look. Here we're in game round one. They would have to reach game round four of their turn to declare war if not attacked and brought into the war earlier. Let's focus only on Germany right now. So Germany could, if they wanted to, on their first turn, come in here and attack this territory. That would bring Russia into the war. That would make an enemy of Germany to Russia. Um, so it's really in Germany's hands when the Russians are able to mobilize and attack. Now there's quite a few restrictions for Russia while neutral and we'll talk about those coming up. And also too with America we'll talk about those later. But when it comes to Germany, they really do hold the upper hand. Now many people, many experienced people will um, use the German units and air force and ships to deal with these um, enemy units first uh, to deal with Paris because if we look on the battle board there's quite a few units to attack there on the battle board so the first turn is very busy for Germany even without attacking Russia but that's not to say that there's no strategies out there where Germany can attack Russia first turn so the idea is will Germany attack Russia turn one turn two turn three will they just not attack Russia and to the point where the max deadline, round four, remember, where even if they're not attacked, Russia could declare war and really should declare war on the Axis powers. And remember, we're talking just about the European Axis powers, not including Japan. When we talk about European Axis powers, that's going to become important when we talk about 
Russia here in a second. Now, when it comes to neutrals, okay, now Germany has some work to do. Here's a pro-allied neutral. Remember, we talked a little bit in the last video about pro-allied neutrals, strict neutrals, pro-axis neutrals. Now, here's five standing army for the pro-allies. Now, because Germany goes first, they can attack this, then they would attack it because it's pro-allies. Now, they could leave it for Italy as well, but here, pro-axis. Now, instead of attacking the standing army, which they would do here against this five, they would come inside this pro-axis Bulgaria and claim the standing army of four. Same thing up here in Finland. They would come in here and claim the standing army of four. Now, they are at war. They can do this. They can, they can activate uh, pro-axis neutrals and they can attack pro-allied neutrals. They can even attack strict neutrals like Portugal or Spain first turn. Now, it's all up to you strategy-wise, but I'm just here to explain to you what you can and cannot do. Now, that is the relationship of the surrounding nations uh, of Germany. You have a close ally just south of you, and then you're surrounded by um, enemies in France and UK, and then you eventually have to deal with the big bear later, but it's up to you when. And of course, it might be more up to Japan on when Germany has to deal with America, and we'll get into that when we talk about Japan. Be right back. Okay, guys, let's get into Russia and their situation. But before I do, just want to acknowledge that I have been shooting a lot of footage in the upside down vantage point, and it may not be ideal for everyone. But uh, trust me when I say that when you play this game enough times, it's really not going to matter uh, which side of the table you're looking at the board from. Of course, it's easy for me to be close and move things and point. There's going to be plenty of opportunity to go to the other side of the board and look at the game board from the upright vantage point here soon. But getting into Russia, I really want to hammer home this point about them being a neutral nation. They cannot go to war and there's restrictions involved. They cannot go to war unless the European Axis powers, Germany or Italy, attack them or even just verbally declare war, maybe attack these boats. Maybe attack all of this, you know, turn one, turn two, or turn three. Now, if that has not happened, they must wait until all the way to round four at the beginning of their turn where they can now declare war. Now, Russia is a very unique situation because if they're at war on this side, it doesn't necessarily mean they're at war on this side against the Japanese and vice versa. So the interesting thing about over here on this side of the board, Russia does not have the same restrictions in the sense of this deadline, round four, where they must wait. They actually can declare war and attack right away against Japan. Now that is going to lift the neutral restrictions from this side of the board, if they do that, but not over here. Okay, well, what are the restrictions? Well, when you're a neutral nation, you cannot um, have any relationship with neutrals whether you attack a pro axis or a strict neutral you can't go into those you can't go into a pro allied neutral you're not considered an ally you're uh, a neutral nation now of course when you go to war with an enemy aka the european axis powers then those restrictions will lift and you can go into neutrals whether you're attacking or um, into pro ally because now you're an ally in europe however just because you're at war with Germany, uh, maybe they attack you turn one, doesn't necessarily mean now your restrictions are lifted over on this side until you're at war with Japan. Now here's an interesting tidbit, an interesting fact. And I know at the beginning of this video I talked about uh, going further into neutrals. I'm not going to really have time. We're going to get into Mongolian neutral in the next video. And there's a lot to be learned about that. But... I want you as the Russian player to go ahead and verbally declare war on Japan right away in your first turn. That's before Japan gets their first turn. Now, even if you're uninterested in attacking them in a military exercise, a verbal declaration of war is a political movement. doesn't necessarily mean you have to go and attack the military, but as a political move, you can verbally declare war. I actually encourage everybody to verbally declare war, even if it's obvious that the enemy has attacked your units and now you're at war. 
just gives a nice uh, a nice theme to the game to be able to just yell across the table and say, I declare war against you. Now, declaring war against Japan is not going to affect the Mongolian rule. It's not going to negate or activate the Mongolians. And again, uh, we'll get into that complexity in a later. So go ahead and declare war against Japan. It's really not going to be an ill effect for Russia at all. In fact, it's going to lift the restrictions over on this side. It's going to allow you to come into these Chinese territories. I couldn't find in the rule book whether or not uh, China actually becomes an ally of Russia. Um, but by lifting the neutrality restrictions over here, I know that Russia can move into these territories and help China because they have a common enemy now in Japan. So um, now, even though you go ahead, like I said, and declare war against Japan, and the restrictions are lifted over here, there's not really a lot. Like, for example, you're not going to attack these as strict neutrals ever. That would be silly. That would turn everything out to Japan. So we're never going to use that situation. It's unnecessary. Um, and we will talk, like I said, about Mongolia further in the next video. But that's not going to change the fact that you're a neutral nation over here where there's lots of neutrals to walk into and lots of nations that you might consider allies, but they're not yet. So therefore, you either are going to wait until the Italians or Germans attack you, or they'll leave you out of the war until it comes time to go ahead and verbally declare war. Why would you verbally declare war if not already brought into the war? Well, obviously, you want to collect national objectives, which is something else that you cannot do if you're not at war. Now, Again, just because you're at war with Japan over here doesn't mean that you can begin collecting your national objectives. I believe all your nat natural, uh, national objectives are revolving around the Europe stage anyway. So, um, therefore, you must be at war with a European Axis power in order to collect that bonus money. All right. Okay, guys, be right back. We're going to talk about the third nation in the order of play, Japan, and their political situations. So here we have Japan, everyone, and their political situation is very flexible. And it seems like they have all the options, whether they decide to bring a Pacific ally into the war early, as early as turn one, or if they play it safe and decide that they're only going to deal with the nation that they are at war with to begin the game, and that's China. So there will be some conflict here, and uh, we'll see that right from the get-go, and it'll be fast and furious there. But... Really, the decisions are all in the hands of Japan. Once they make a lot of those big decisions, it's really hard to go back from the consequences um, or even just the victories that you gain from doing these things. Um, I did say as Russia go ahead and declare war against Japan right from the get-go, and uh, it's highly likely that Japan will get their first turn already um, having an enemy in Russia. Now, they'll go ahead and probably declare war war on Russia themselves. However, all this may not even develop into any attacks. What they're going to do maybe is focus on China. If they decide to stay out of the war, they're going to position themselves. But however, it's very likely as well that an aggressive Japan player will go ahead and attack these ships. Turn one, they will go ahead and attack the Philippines and all these ships around here. They may even take out this battleship. So there are some rewards to attacking first turn. And that is taking down income from the allies in the form of just easy kills. Now, if they decide to wait till round two, a lot of these ships may not be such easy pickings. They will have been deployed by the nations in a non-combat movement. And therefore, they won't be so easy to kill from here on in. Now, there's the other option of maybe round three. Or just leaving them out of the war, not provoking them, and allowing America to stay neutral all the way till their own deadline of when they're allowed to declare war on the Axis powers. So all this is in Japan's hands. Uh, they really dictate a lot of uh, what happens in the first few rounds over here. Um, I will say that Japan has a national objective that they do collect when they're not at war. I mean, they are at war with China, but... The mass majority, if not all, of their national objectives involve 
something where they would have to bring a Pacific ally into the war. And remember, the Pacific allies are America, Anzac, and the United Kingdom. We're not including China or Russia as Pacific allies, okay? So their national objective is that they get 10 IPCs trade with America if they don't bring any Pacific allies into the war, no, no unprovoked attack, and they do not attack French Indochina. They'll get 10 IPCs during peacetime to go ahead and attack China and whatnot. However, a lot of Japanese players might feel that the money that they can sink here and sink here and whatnot might add up to more than that, but they will not get the 10 IPC national objective if they do a unprovoked attack even if they walk into here make an attack take French Indochina it does not mean that the Pacific Allies will come into the war but it does mean that they're going to give up the 10 IPC national objective trade with America so they can come up in here give up the 10 IPCs take two IPCs but it still would not bring the Allies into the war the Pacific Allies into the war so there may be a strategy where they want to get this early and build a factory on it and give up eight IPCs because the 10 minus the two. But I don't see that often anyway, but that is the political situation surrounding that 10 IPC national objective. The majority of their national objectives, I believe, if not all of them, after that involve bringing a Pacific ally into the war. So um, the, major, the major focus here is when do the Japanese attack the Pacific allies? Um, when do they just collect their 10 IPCs and focus in on here? When do they uh, decide to provoke and attack America, Anzac, and the UK? It's, it's kind of up to them, but there is a, a little bit of a hook we'll talk about in a later clip. But we really want to understand that what Japan does over here when it comes to bringing America into the war is really going to affect their ally uh, Germany and Italy over there in Europe you know that because the Americans are gaining money as well remember that the US is a neutral nation so they don't collect IPC so attacking them is gonna bear consequences not only are you gonna lose IPCs in your 10 IPC national objective for trade with America but you're also gonna be handing your enemy a lot of IPCs in the form of um, not their own national objectives. A lot of people still believe that taking out these units turn one uh, compensates for all of that. But that is the political situation. Any attack on Borneo, which is a um, Pacific Allied territory, is considered an attack which brings all allies into the war. Any attack in Celebes or Dutch New Guinea, even though this is Dutch, it's not a playable power, but it is an ally. Any attack on those is going to bring the uh, Pacific Allies into the war so you really have to understand that what are the consequences of bringing these allies into the war you're gonna be faced with uh, the options of their own attacks and also to um, just uh, being surrounded by enemies now remember we've got Russia up here that's an enemy we've got China here that's an enemy the UK of course Anzac and America, they're surrounded by five separate enemies, all multinational, but can still uh, be a pain. Maybe the better way to go as a new player is to just focus on China and get into position for when you do have to deal with them. Come up with some advanced, more experienced strategies about dealing with all of these um, enemies right from the get-go in a later time. All right, so I believe I looked over the political situations. Next, we'll get into America and China. Cheers. So the next nation I want to talk about, guys, is America. The United States is fourth in the order of play. Now, they have interests over here in the Pacific. They have some factories where they can build some units. And, of course, they have some units that are starting over there. They also have an investment over here in the Atlantic where they have some factories. They can spawn some units and already have some units invested on this side of the board to begin the game. So as I reminded you in the last clip, America is a neutral nation, so therefore they have no enemies to begin the game. They have no allies to begin the game. And I will be uh, swinging the camera from left to right here to show you a few things. Now, they do have restrictions just like Russia. Now, they're not the same restrictions, of course, okay? Now, we already went 
into detail about Russia and their uh, specific situation and uh, how unique it is between their enemies on the Europe front and their enemies over here against Japan in the Pacific. It's not quite like that for America. When America is at war with an Axis power, they are at war with all Axis powers. So as a neutral nation, uh, when it comes to both Russia and America, they cannot collect any national objectives, the bonus income that is in this game. They must wait until they're at war, and then when the collect income phase comes around and they are at war, then they can go ahead and collect for any national objectives that they have gained or have achieved, okay? Now, the Americans uh, have some movement restrictions while neutral. Um, the movement restrictions for Russia is just stay within your own originally controlled territories. But when it comes to these fleets here, over here in the Pacific is different than the Atlantic. So in the Pacific, these ships, while neutral, can move around wherever they like. However, they may not stop or end their turn in a sea zone that has an originally controlled Japanese territory adjacent to it. So therefore, for example, obviously they cannot end their turn sitting right here in sea zone 6. They cannot end their turn sitting here with ships in sea zone 32. Obviously, when they're a neutral nation, they're not going to be jumping and controlling on Marshall Islands. They're not allowed to. And that is part of their neutrality. They're just not allowed to attack unless they're brought into the war by an unprovoked attack or they have a deadline and it's different than Russia's. We'll get into that. But they can end their turn anywhere they like as long as it's not adjacent to any Japanese originally controlled territory. Therefore, they could to come down here and end their turn in 54 because there is a naval base here. All these ships can go one, two, and three. And even though Anzac is not an ally, they can end their movement with ships here in 54 because they're obeying the rule about not being in a sea zone or stopping ships, ending their turn adjacent to an enemy controlled territory, but, but they can be here. However, because they have no ally, they can't use the use of these bases. Now, of course, when they do enter the war, Australia is going to become an ally, of course, of the United States. And therefore, when they are adjacent to a naval base like this here, they can use it as if it were their own. But while neutral, even though they are allowed to park here, they're not an ally of Anzac, therefore cannot use these bases until they're actually at war. So that's a bit of a positioning tactic that the Americans can do while they're neutral. There's not many of them. Obviously, if they do not get attacked by Japan, turn one with these ships, you're going to want to get out of Dodge. And uh, one of the more popular places to go is here, simply because with the base there that they control, they can get there. The plane usually goes to Guam in an effort to save that because when Japan does bring them into war, you don't want this to be um, left here for to just get destroyed. It's going to be an easy win for Japan. So there is some strategy involved with maneuvering as a neutral nation. And I guess I didn't mention this with Russia, of course. I mean, obviously, if you're left out of the war, you're going to use your non-combat movement phase to position all your starting units in a way that gets you prepared for war. And over here, there are some restrictions. Unfortunately, uh, the restrictions over here are a bit tighter. The United States are not allowed to move naval ships anywhere unless they are adjacent to an originally controlled territory of America. Therefore, only here and here they can sit. It's easy enough. So when they're neutral, your ships cannot wander out and go pretend to be at war. Um, that's not allowed. They either have to stay here or here. So they have to stay adjacent to an originally controlled territory. They can't even come up here, even if it is to Site C and go to Peggy's Cove. But there is a rule about patrolling. I mean, if it's not a transport or a sub, I believe, or something, I think, um, I think cruisers are allowed, destroyers are allowed. They can go into 102. 
So that's the only exception that uh, some C units, but not all C units can go into one and two. They call it a patrol. But I've never seen that to tell you the truth. If anybody has understood any, any kind of beneficial strategy that involves that patrol rule, go ahead and comment in the in the description, uh, in the comments, right? But because there's a naval base here, being here isn't going to get you any closer to any sea zone. Uh, that being here would still get you. Um, so obviously I'll let you know that you can come through and enter the other side. So while you're neutral, you can come through here and enter the other side. You can bring ships from San Francisco the same way you can come here. I've got a little um, blurb on my map. You won't have this on your out-of-box map, but it says adjacent to 64. So you come into here, into 11, and then over there into 64. You can do those things while you're neutral just to, like I said, get, get some positioning. Obviously, you can't do anything about a J1 attack on your units uh, except to try and roll well. Uh, now, when you do come into the war, whether it's turn one, two, three, or three, you will be able to get your national objectives, all of them. And um, these factories will turn into major factories. Those are minor factories on my board. And I'll show you what a major factory looks like. And that's my major factories. And when America comes into the war, they will get those upgraded for free. Okay. And of course, like I said, their national objectives and then all their um, neutral restrictions will be lifted. They don't have to worry about not stopping here adjacent to these Japan territories. They don't have to worry about staying so close to homelands over here. Okay. They can start going to Gibraltar. They can start working with the UK to wage war. And um, so the deadline for America to enter the war, if not yet provoked, is the collect income phase of round three. Now, I understand that's confusing considering that we're talking about the timeline for Russia here, which is the beginning of their turn, beginning of their turn round four, that is the timeline for Russia. So if you think about it, if you're allowed to declare war at the beginning of your turn and your combat movement phase is lower, then that means you're able to attack in round four. Now... The game does not want America attacking round three. Therefore, they allow them to declare war against their enemies, if not already provoked into war, during the collect income phase of round three. So therefore, if they're not yet at war, if they're a neutral nation by round three, then they will not be able to use their combat movement phase because, of course, they cannot attack. And then at the end of their turn, their round, collect income, they can declare war. Well, why did they want to do it that way? Well, they don't want America declaring war and attacking round three, but they want them to collect all that bonus income round three. So by putting their declaration limit or deadline during the collect income phase of round three, it restricts them from attacking, but it allows them to collect all their bonus national objective money and that's if they're left out of the war all that time okay Japan may have something to say about that they may attack the Pacific Allies sooner all right guys uh, so that is America just in a nutshell we'll get into China here in a second however I'm just going to take a short break be right back let's all go to the lobby Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Okay, everybody, we are back. And I explained that I was going to talk about China next. However, this is going to be very brief, simply because China has a lot of rules. And I'm not going to get into it all in this video. I'm actually going to go over all of the China-specific rules in the next video so so far I explained we're going to talk about the Mongolian rule in the next video we're going to talk about China rules in the next video and to sum it up we're going to talk about the split economy of UK Pacific and UK Europe in the next video the only thing that we need to understand right now about China 
is that they do begin the game at war with Japan. So um, they're already in conflict with Japan. It's not clear yet on whether or not they have allies and who those allies are. But again, we'll go over all of that in the next video. I want to skip and go right into the United Kingdom. We have the United Kingdom Pacific. UK Pacific has Calcutta, which is a capital that collects their own income based on the territories that they control over on this side. We'll go over that in the split economy video of next episode. We also have here London, which is the capital on the Europe side of the map for UK Europe. And they also collect their income based on the territories that they control over here on this side of the map. Well, what's to say the difference between the map? We've got a bit of an invisible line right here. Everything here is Pacific. Everything here is Europe. This here, Western India, however, is going to be part of the UK Pacific economy and British Columbia up there is going to be part of the Europe economy. But as far as political situations go, we already understand that UK Europe is at war with Germany and Italy to start the game. And they don't have many allies to begin with, but they are at war. And over here, UK Pacific, how Calcutta, is not at war, however, with Japan. Now, even though they are not at war with Japan, and remember, they cannot collect the national advantages associated with this half of the economy, but they can attack Japan without any restrictions. So attacking Japan would propel them into the war. Okay, and they have that option. They don't have to wait for Japan to attack them. However, there is a consequence by, by the United Kingdom attacking Japan while neutral means while Japan did not attack them during their first term or second term. So now if the UK Pacific is attacking Japan, well, that might be unprovoked and America here would not be able to join them if that were the case. Now remember, if Japan attacks Anzac or UK Pacific or even America, then all the Pacific allies are at war. Okay, But if the UK does an unprovoked attack on any of the Japanese units or territories, then Japan could safely go to war with the UK and Anzac and China without worrying about America. They would actually likely leave America out of the war for a long time, keep them neutral, because now they were gifted with enough enemies to go after. Now, that's not to say that attacking Japan with the UK is a bad move. A lot of the times... You know, Japan might be sleeping at the wheel and forget about the fact that the UK could get brave and attack them and they could lose a lot of significant units. And um, I would say if Japan has not attacked by round two, then I would say look for an attack. The UK should look for an attack because it won't be long before the Americans are into the war. And remember, this one here, there's a national objective for holding Hong Kong and I believe um, Malaya. Uh, there's a national objective there. Obviously, if Japan attacks the Pacific Allies, one of the first things they're going to go for here is Hong Kong. Therefore, after brought into the war, India will not really collect for that national objective. But if Japan has not attacked the UK first, and the UK attacks them, then they're almost guaranteed to collect that extra five bucks. So you got to look for the pros and cons where you can find them, okay, when it comes to these decisions. But the political situation over here essentially has Anzac and UK tied together. What happens to one happens to the other, okay? So if Japan attacks Anzac, this cruiser, then it automatically brings all the Pacific allies into the war. But if it's the UK that attacks Japan, then it's as if Anzac declared war as well. Because what happens to Anzac happens to the UK. If the UK decide to bring Japan into the war, then Anzac as well. And there is a bit of a separation there when it comes to those two versus the United States when talking about 
the Pacific Allies. Another thing that's very important to talk about here in the, in the political situations video are these islands. These are Dutch islands. Now, the Dutch are not a playable power. However, it explains in the rules how the Dutch have sort of handed over guardianship of these, these territories to Britain and Anzac, but not America. Okay, Britain and Anzac. So, we have Sumatra here, for example, okay? Even not at war, okay? Consider this an ally. Now, the rules state uh, about the liberation of territories, and I'm not going to get into that right here, right now. But, as a unique situation, if this happens, even when not at war, then the UK are going to claim the four IPCs as if it's an attack. If this was Japan and Britain did this and they um, they went ahead and sorry did this, then they would collect the four IPCs and take it away from Japan. But because it's Dutch, it's ally, it's not an attack, it's a non-combat movement, but it's still going to be belonging to the UK Pacific because of the guardianship rule. Okay, so it's almost as if it's like theirs. It's almost as if it's just like their own territories. However, you have to land on it to actually claim the income. And the same goes for Anzac. Anzac could do the same thing. Even not at war, they could come to Java, land here, take the four IPCs. But they're landing as if it's a landing on a friendly territory. But the way that they take the four IPCs, okay? The way that they take the four IPCs here... It seems hostile, but it's just the guardianship rule. It's an ally, but you have to go out there and claim it. So jumping on this and guarding it is going to give you that. Now, if you go and run away like this, it's always going to stay this. Now, it's never going to be Dutch again. It'll either be um, Japan or uh, an ally fighting over it. Okay, But that initial landing has to be had. Now, some people ask this all the time. This is allowed. If Anzac wants to come and land on this, whether we're at war or, or not at war, that's allowed. They cannot, however, claim it because it takes a land unit to claim it. So that's not allowed. Now, positioning wise, they can jump here and they can be there. They just won't get the IPCs. Now, this could happen turn one. That could happen turn one. So the pl plane could come and land. Why is this strange? Well, we haven't talked about this, but... Planes are not allowed to land on newly taken territories. So this is a very unique situation within the game. Because you got a plane, plane landing on something that is a newly taken territory. However, in this situation, Dutch is already considered an ally. So as far as the plane is concerned, it's landing on a friendly territory. Whether they're at war or not. The fact that they're actually claiming the four IPCs, that's the difference in regards to... Um, hostile takeovers and this particular friendly takeover of the four IPCs that was originally Dutch. Okay, so that's a unique situation that we need to understand as a part of these political situations. Now, one thing that you need to know is America cannot do that. Only UK and Anzac can pull off the kind of move that I just talked to you about. Now, if Japan controls Java, then yes, America could come liberate this and then, in, in a sense, um, put their own roundel on here and take the four IPCs and the income tracker would go up and down. However, America cannot come and land on this while it's Dutch. They're not part of the nations that were in charge of guardianship of those islands. Okay? So, very important to understand. Something else that I want to talk to you about in regards to the UK, if the Germans or Italians or they come and they do sea line, they perform a landing on London and they take that capital, or even if it's just an attempt, Germany does not have to successfully take London, even if they just attempt to take London, that will immediately bring Russia and America into the war. So it's like an attack on 
America and Russia. So if you do a sea line attack, you need to understand by motioning to even attempt to take sea line, don't even have to be successful in this operation. I mean, to take London. Um, then it's just like if you were attacking Russia and bringing them into the war, just like if you were attacking America, bringing them into the war. So the uh, European Axis powers, if they're going to do that sea line strategy, they need to understand that too as a political situation. To know that, hey, why not attack a couple of territories in Russia on the same turn that you're going to do sea line, right? Okay, we're starting to get into some complexity now. All right, uh, we went over uh, a lot so far. Let me just do one last clip and sum up uh, the remaining nations to talk about when dealing with declarations of war and political situations. Be right back. So the next nation in the order of play after the UK is Italy. And their political situations are very straightforward. They begin the game at war with the United Kingdom. Italy begins the game at war with France. And they're surrounded by these enemies in and around their capital. So they're very focused on the Mediterranean theater of war here. And also they've got some units in Africa. So they're in the fight right away. They're going to be uh, not too concerned with neutral nations like Russia or America. Even though if they do come into the war early, um, a lot of what they're worried about comes in the first couple of rounds. For example, the UK goes first. And you can see that the United Kingdom could attack and destroy many Italian units before Italy even gets a first turn. So, um, like I said, they're very focused on just being at war and getting good dice rolls, strategizing because they do get national objectives. And we'll go into those details in the next video. But they will be trying to achieve and strive for national objectives to give them even more money because they don't start with a lot. So that's Italy. Let's move on quickly and talk again about Anzac, who is next after Italy in the order of play. We already talked a lot about Anzac, not much more to go over. When it comes to all their national objectives and everybody's national objectives, we're going to look at those in detail in the next video. But I talked already about how Anzac is tied to the UK Pacific and vice versa in the sense that what happens to one happens to the other. We already talked about these Dutch territories in the last video and I just want to show you one more aspect here and take a look. It does make sense why Anzac is at war with both Italy and Germany because they've got a couple of elite soldiers right here in Egypt so very, it's very feasible that they get into battles with Italy right away so there's no neutrality here, no declarations of war needed. Anzac and UK, whether it be UK Europe or UK Pacific, are at war with Italy and Germany to begin the game. Okay, obviously we talked about the complex political situation nature of the Pacific. And if there's something that comes up in the comment boards they want me to touch on over here, I'll do it in the next video. And last in the order of play is France. France, take a look here. France has the blue units on the board. They have a very unique situation in the sense that may, they may end up not even having a capital come their first turn. Look at Paris. It's uh, very standard that Germany sends in enough units to attack France and destroy Paris and everything here in it. You can see that there's also some British units in the setup there. So when France has a turn and they are a playable nation with an income and a turn sequence at the very end of the round they will be able to move around their units and whatnot but another thing we're going to touch on in the next video is capturing capitals and handing over their cash on hand and everything that happens with that what happens with these territories that are under French control if they don't have a capital also liberating capitals we're going to talk about that but uh, essentially half of what happens in the turn set sequence for France will not be available to them simply because they have no money or they cannot collect an income. They will, however, be able to move their units and attack and they're going to try and do their best to coordinate with their allies on what the best attacks are. 
and, and whatnot. And that is a full game round. We talked about a lot of different political situations, mostly about declaring war and neutral nations. And I know it was a long video, guys, but this material is very, very helpful for anybody learning this game. It's definitely essential to knowing. Um, if you want to be a good player, you have to understand the rules. A lot of this political situation complexity really scares away a lot of new people. But trust me, once you understand it, it comes second nature. The last thing you want to do, however, is just jump into a game and just, just assuming things. And then once you start playing the game a certain way and it's wrong, it's very hard to get out of that habit and play the right way. Of course, we all want to play the game in the way in which it was meant to be played. That's why I take great detail in explaining these things to you in these videos. And that's why we're going to do another political situation video immediately in the next episode. There's still lots to go over. Things like, I mentioned the Mongolian rule. We're going to talk about the Turkish Strait. We're going to talk about China rules and everything involved there. And this split economy between the UK, Europe and UK Pacific that is a bit confusing to many people. We're going to make sure that we explain that one properly. And we're also going to look at the national advantages. I'm sorry, national objectives. We're going to look at detail what each, what each nation is trying to strive for to get extra money in order to buy more powerful weapons and place them on the board. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate you sticking through this long video. And uh, I hope I didn't get anything wrong. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate the comments, the likes, and the shares. Thank you, thank you to all my patrons over on my Patreon page. I hope you had a great Christmas. And may all your dice rolls be ones. We'll see you in the next episode. This has been Axonale's Gaming Academy Advanced Training. We're learning Axonale's 1940 Global Second Edition. Cheers, guys.